Hello everyone. Today we're going to continue from last session about Copali. We will dive deeper into the indexing process, including how do we process the input PDF pages, how to create patches out of one single PDF page, and how do we encode those input patches uh, and project that into a projection layer. We will talk about how online querying is going to be handled throughout the architecture of Copali. We will also talk about the full end-to-end -end architecture of a REC system incorporating Copali as well as some potential applications using Copali. Despite its amazing performance, we're also recognizing one caveat using this technique. So stick around to the end to find out. Let's dive in. All right. Now this indexing uh, process includes several steps. The first step is we need to process these PDF documents. The first step is to convert each PDF uh, document or a PDF page into an image. The second step is to create patches. We divide each page into smaller uh, patches, smaller chunks that is really called patch. In this paper, they divide it into 1,030 patches of roughly like 32 by 32 pixels. So each patch captures a small portion of the image. Um, and they also experimented with different number of patches. You could have you know, 1,000 patches because if you increase or decrease the size, the number of patches, then I mean, you're dealing with bigger patch. So there is a trade-off in there. Each patch is represented as a 128 dimensional vector um, for compact representation uh, because think about it. If one page is 1,000 patches, then and each patch is a vector of 128, right? And that it's still a lot of memory to store these vectors. That's why they tried and they cut it or they used a very small 128 dimensional uh, vector, just not to really consume a lot of memory. So the pseudocode for that, basically we split images into patches, right? I pass my PDF page and I specify the number of patches and then uh, the output will be the number of patches themselves. The second step here is to pass all of the patches through this vision encoder layer, which is SIGLIP in this case. So again, this is like a pseudocode. We have to iterate over each patch and then we have to apply this SIGLIP encoder on each patch and then we add them into a list. So here we are dealing with a list of embeddings, right? They call image tokens. All right. The next step is we are passing these embeddings through a projection layer. And the reason that we do that is to somehow convert these embeddings into an appropriate dimension so we can feed it into this LLM, right? Because LLMs, they work with a specific input embeddings and this output is not necessarily matching, right? We cannot directly just feed them into LLM. So they have this projection layer here. And then the next step is we just pass them um, through this LLM and the LLM is gamma 2 billion parameter. So if you have a function called gamma B model, then we just pass the patches. So we pass, we pass all the patches together, not one by one, right? And the reason is because we do that because this uh, gamma is going to understand the relationship between each patch and the nearby patches. So it add some contextual information into that. I have a question. So the first step, you, the vision encoder will represent one vector embedding per patch. And then you want to understand patch to patch context, basically. Yes. Then you pass in to the LLM to understand the contextual surroundings of each patch so that the final embedding is more contextual aware. Why do we pass it through uh, an LLM? We don't have any contextual information. We have just a bunch of, a bunch of embeddings, right? That they, we don't right. want a relationship between each one of them. Are you right? That makes sense. I was just thinking like, is the vision encoder also works there? And then I think that doesn't make any sense because the vision encoder deals with the images. And then now once you transform the images into embeddings and then the LLMs can work with the embeddings to understand vector to vector relationship. Yes. The vision encoder, we just pass each embedding, each patch through that vision encoder um, separately, individually. So we pass it, it gives us another vector. We pass another vector. But it doesn't give us any information about how they are related. That's right. the job of the, the LLM. Actually understand that 
right? Because each patch or is it say like a word, right? They understand right. the relationship between each word. Yeah, the visual encoder, the, the input is going to be the patch, the, the RGB, right? The pixels, it's treating it completely as an image. Um, my, right? Uh, no, it, uh, the vision encoder, it extracts visual information from that patch. The patch is essentially part of the image. If it's a chart, part of a chart, right? Pass it to that vision encoder, this sickly, then it understand that, oh, it's part of a chart and maybe it has you no, know, this, I don't know, information in there and things like that. That's the vision right. encoder because it understands the images. So the representation is the red, green, blue, pixelated no, 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 no. representation of the image? No, I mean, that's that's no? the beginning. That's when we just divide the page into images, so these patches. Patch is essentially those RGB and all that. Right. We flatten each patch into a vector and then right. pass it through the um, vision. vision encoder. Then it's like an embedding of a word or a sentence. Right. The right. Embedding of a word is just like this floating point number. I see. Okay. In this case, this vision encoder, it, it understands visual cues and rather than right. just the text. Okay. That makes more sense. The role of the vision encoder versus the LLM component. Yeah, it's more clear. All right. Then after we pass all the image tokens or embeddings through LLM, then we also do another projection just to make sure that the end result is a vector of size 128 for each patch, each image token. So here, think about this document as a document which has end words. Then at the end, we are going to get n uh, vectors of size 128. For each word, we will have one embedded. That's the output, right? And again, this is the pseudocode for that. So remember when we are dealing with uh, embedding models for text, when we pass one sentence or one document, then we will get one vector for the entire document. In this case, we are doing it for each word of a document because we are going to use this late interaction, this Colbert approach. And I re I, I'll explain the reason why we do that. All right. So when we pass all the patches through this process and we end up with the final embeddings, we store them in some kind of data store. And now we repeat this for all the PDF pages of the entire corpus. After that, when user asks a question, then we pass the query. The query is encoded using the language model. Okay. So we convert it into embedding and then we do a late interaction process in this case to find the similarities between the query tokens and the document patches. So let me show you in this picture here. This is my, my document page and these are the patches and it, this is the user query here. So each here we have, if, if it has whatever number of words it has, if it has six words, then we will have six different vectors. Right. For each word, we will have one embedding, one vector. Then what we will do is we calculate the similarity between each word embedding and all of the patches here. Okay. And then we select the highest score as the similarity score of that particular word. And then we repeat that for all of the words. So each word will have one score because it's an aggregated over all of these scores here. So this is called late interaction. And then the system returns the most relevant documents based on these scores. So this is for one document. We have to repeat this for all the documents. I have a question. Maybe you will explain it here too. So for each word, you have a winner, basically. One patch winner for each word. So how do you aggregate the result? Like you might be having like six different images, six patches, right? So we will retain, because anyway, what we will return is the entire document here, right? So we will return entire document is entire page. Mm -hmm. But part of this page is more relevant and more important. How do we find that is by just calculating these similarities here for each word. Mm -hmm. And this, these scores will use later on to generate the response. I see. If the goal is to end up with one page, like at least fetch the top Okay, pages, that's relevant. So maybe these numbers, these scores can be aggregated together for one page because we're looking for anywhere that's relevant to the query for each page. So you have an aggregated score for each page and then you can find the, the most relevant page. That's the whole point, right? Because anyway, we need to return top K PDF pages. So that's why we have to calculate those techniques like ANN and all that vector databases. 
think about it just to make it easier. Think about this as textual document. So when you have a user query, you just go into the vector database and find the top five relevant chunks, right? Now those relevant chunks or documents are pages that you return them. Okay. Indeed. Yeah, makes sense. So if I want to show this Colbert late interaction, if we have a document, then for each token or word, that's to make it simpler, um, for each word, we just pass it through the embedding model. So we end up with N words and embeddings. So you can see like here, each word or token has its own embeddings. And then if there is a query, we just pass it through the same embedding model. It gives us this query has three words in there or tokens in there. So we will end up with um, three embedding vectors. Then in order to find the relevance between this query and this document, we just calculate the similarity between this word and all of the words in the document. And we just choose the highest one, right? The similarity, which is maximum and repeat that for this one and then for this one. So here, if you look at this Colbert embedding, we can see that. So if you're doing a keyword search, then we are just matching against the exact words in the query. If we do semantic search, then we are essentially just considering the entire semantic meaning. The problem is with this dense embedding or semantic search is that we lack this explainability. So Colbert is going to give us a better explainability because um, we are calculating the similarity between each word of the query and everything, all the entire document. Then we can find the words that have high impacts in this case, like best places for uh, hiking with kids. You can see that hiking and families, they have higher, dirt, like more black means it's a better match, right? And some words are less important. So we can do it at the word level, but we cannot do the same thing for semantic search. So that's the difference between late interaction, this Colbert and semantic search. Yeah, cool. All right. Now, if you look at this cold poly, then this is the architecture end to end. So we have the corpus, we parse each page, parse meaning that cold poly parse, essentially. Cold poly embeddings, and then uh, we pass it through all those steps that I just explained, and then we store them in a vector database. And so this part, uh, this is the document indexing phase, and then uh, when the user asks a question, we need to do some image retrieval. So image retrieval means returns the top five relevant PDF pages. That's the retrieval part. But if you want to really answer the user question, we need to pass these images into some kind of vision language model, right? Because the retrieved uh, documents are images. So we cannot just use regular LLM. It has to be a vision language model. So we pass those top retrieval to this, and then it will generate a human readable as a response for the user. So uh, another interesting thing about this call poly is this similarity map, because we are doing it at the word level and for each patch for, for user query, then we calculate the similarity between the, this um, tokens of the query and all the patches, and we find the highest, the maximum score. And then if we visualize them, then you can see which part of the image is more important, paid more attention. And this is a very interesting approach, right? Visualization. All right. Now, if you want to implement this visual document retrieval approaches like Cold Poly, there is a very good benchmark, a leaderboard on Hugging Face, where you can go and see which approach is the best approach in terms of accuracy and performance and different metrics there. So this is actually very useful. And... In terms of applications, there has been several different implementations of this call poly. The original call poly used this polygamma as the vision language model, but nowadays with these coin models, which have become pretty popular because they are really very capable, then there are other applications which have used this coin vision language models. And the accuracy is even higher. So one of them is from this company Vespa. They are like a vector database company, like Quadrant, VV8 and all that. And they are not the only one, but one of the companies who invested a lot on this call poly approach. And they have a very interesting application, which you can download this entire application, you know, the GitHub repo and all that. So I put the link down below here. You can even download the repo and use it. Just a couple of other links. One of them is the 
official uh, GitHub repo for the cold calling. They have a lot of examples and things like that. You can go and check out. And this is another incrementation of cold calling, as I said, that um, has used a uh, Cohen model. And because it's smaller, it's faster, and it's more capable, it's more accurate. I have one last question. So what do you think of the cost in terms of using Copali approach versus? So that's a very good question. It is actually a costly solution because, because we are dealing with obviously patches, right? And these patches are nothing but words. So we are embedding documents at the word level. You can think about it that way, but here documents are images. And the memory footprint is huge. If you have a very large uh, corpus of PDFs and all that, then you have to somehow optimize it. You have to, for example, use binary quantization and things like that. So instead of representing as embeddings of floating point numbers, then you can use a binary. You can even use dimensionality reduction approaches. Instead of using a embedding of size 1000, in this case, they are using 128. So you have to do several different optimizations to make it work. And Vespa actually, they have, as I said, they have, they are really good at this, implementing this approach. So, but overall it is, um, you have to do several different optimizations to make sure that uh, you can handle it. You can scale it in production. So it's costly. So there's no free lunch, so maybe a high performing approach, but it also comes with some cost. And exactly. And the cost that I said, I didn't even include the vision language model at the end for response generation, mm -hmm. because you have to use a quite capable model like GPT uh, vision or Claude. Um, that's expensive so too. That's expensive too, compared to regular chat GPT, LLM, text-based chat GPT or GPT. So you have to use either them, which become extremely expensive if you do it at scale. If you do it for just a few documents, probably not. Um, or you have to use these open source models like Quen and all that, but then you have to worry about where to host them or somehow use some hosted versions or again. So these are the things that you need to be cautious about, right? To be mindful of. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks for another great session, Really, I'll see you next time. See ya.